Let me introduce today's sponsor. NordVPN has 5,200 plus servers in 60 countries. Find a server near you for better speed or in a faraway location for more content and streaming services like Netflix and Crunchyroll. You can use it on six devices and it's available on every major platform from Windows, Android, iOS, Mac OS, Linux, and even Android TV. Open the map, click on a location, and you'll be connected in seconds. It's that easy. Click the link in the pinned comment and description below and use the code Alex Enterprises to get a two year subscription plus one extra month free at a 73% discount. It's risk free because it's satisfied or refunded for the first 30 days. Thanks NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Remember when I covered the two Hunter x Hunter movies and why they both fundamentally misunderstood how Togashi goes about creating things? Turns out that legendary mangaka Yoshihiro Togashi's first acclaimed series, Yu Yu Hakusho, also received two movies back in the 1990s. If you remember, the Hunter x Hunter movies had such strong premises that it came as a massive blow to see that they failed on the delivery in almost every single other way. Though Hunter x Hunter is famed for its power system, something which is fairly complex I suppose, but that's something that Yu Yu Hakusho doesn't have to deal with as much, so it can't be that bad, right? This is one of those strange 30 minute movies that came out quite often in and around the 1990s. Maybe budgeting for anime films back then, particularly the kind shown on television was a little more stingy back in the day. But regardless of budget, this movie and many like it were a couple minutes longer than a single episode would be. As you can imagine from such an existence, there's not much they could do with it. Even One Piece had to put up with 45 minute films for its first few years. And that series was meeting overwhelming success at that point. The film is about Koenma on vacation getting abducted by demons. The demons, Garuga and Koashira, want to use Koenma to get the mysterious golden seal. Botan gets both Yusuke and Kuwabara to help, and Botan explains that whoever has complete control of the golden seal gains the ability to control the spirit world. Something so clearly breaking the law that it's not even worth pointing out. It's just a powerful relic with a tacked on power so that the plot can get going. As they go to fight Koenima's captors, Kurama joins the trio and helps them fight off the horde of demons around Garuga and Kawashira's lair. There's a pretty substantial amount of animation, and this is Cell as well, but yeah, they pretty much beat the two and reclaim the Golden Seal, and everything is returned to normal in a whole 20 minutes. As it sounds, this is a bit of a mad dash for the finish line that itself beckons the question, why were they so ambitious in the first place? Due to the running time, I'm less inclined to be angry with it and more disappointed as it comes across as though the Golden Seal was financed as more or less a 30 minute demo reel of what Yu Yu Hakusho fight scenes can really look like. But even looking at just the beginning, you can see that this was something to throw together. And the proof of that is in the uncertainty of where things were going, with a filler deus ex machina being introduced and all the four being quite underpowered. It also comes as a bit of a wasted opportunity that the soundtrack is exactly the same as the show, with nothing new produced for it on the musical side of things. Unfortunately, all this time later, as someone wanting to get away from the hiatus, it simply comes across as bland and uninspired, occasionally pretty, but overall worthless. Does that sound at all like Yu Yu Hakusho? Afraid not. 6 out of 10. Given a much longer 95 minute running time, Yu Yu Hakusho The Poltergeist Report is an actual film by modern day standards. Carrying on the improvement of visuals and releasing to coincide with the ending of the TV show, it paints a weirdly similar picture to that of Hunter x Hunter, which also got two movies released to coincide with the airing of the show. Unfortunately, as we saw, the Hunter x Hunter movies were shameless, cash grabs that cared neither for character nor continuity, and with the golden seal being akin to a 30 minute demo reel, it's not looking good. But wouldn't you know, it's actually really good. The animation cell again by the way is just staggering. You can tell that they upped the budget because unlike the show and the first film which was painted on 10F sheets, smaller 4x3 aspect ratio sheets that only accommodated so much detail due to their size, this film is done on proper 15F sheets, the likes of which Ghibli animated on and that's not to demerit the talent behind the movie itself because it does look really good. Also, unlike the first film, there's finally an original soundtrack composed by the same musician as the show itself. So unlike the Hunter x Hunter films, an extra bonus is some new sounds that you'd have thought were there all along, but alas, it's a new score. 
It starts with a tsunami in the spirit world, where Koenma, showing an inkling of suspicion, orders Botan to take an unspecified object to Yusuke. She obliges and flies away, witnessing the utter destruction of the spirit world in a pretty epic beginning. In Japan, Yusuke is taken aback when she arrives in tatters, giving him unclear instructions and fainting on the spot. Yusuke tells Keiko to look after her whilst him and Kuwabara try and follow her instructions. They head to Kasune Shrine where a young girl is being attacked by demons. Her name is Hinegeshi. After saving her, the whole group reconvenes where Kurama states that the whole spirit world has been submerged with a group of people bearing a cross on their foreheads as the culprit. The group are deduced to be from the nether world, the parallel to the demon world in the same way that the spirit world is parallel to the human world. It's a reveal of a trinity of realms, a deeper and more nightmarish one. By channeling the powers of the elements in the human world, the team deduce that they can direct power to the spiritual world to battle the powers of the netherworld and stop the destruction. Whilst this happens, demons from the netherworld are capturing the first elemental site. They discover this for themselves the next day, so obviously they rush to the second site, but even that has been tainted by a demon who reveals himself as one of the three gods of the netherworld. Yakumo. He overpowers them and gets away. Another site is lost when Kurama finds that his old partner, long dead, is a vengeful entity in the netherworld, claiming a third elemental site. With just Kuwabara and Majare, the second god of the netherworld, left to battle it out, Kuwabara actually uses his wits and some clever intellect to work around Majare's abilities, though it's not enough to stop the elemental site to be claimed by the netherworld, meaning all Earth's natural power is now theirs. With all but one person from the spirit world, the nether gods arrive at the temple to kill Botan, and they actually take her. Out of all of these filler films, this is the most like Togashi with the tremendous amount of loss. It's a really refreshing and unexpected change of pace. The heroes take a short breather and then advance, where Kurama is singled out and fights his old friend one on one. Just as Kurama defeats him, Hiei is singled out and cursed by his opponent, going on a rampage and almost destroying the city. But thankfully, he overcomes this curse and defeats his opponent, thanks to the power of the Black Dragon, which holds a greater power over him. With just Yakumo left, draining Botan of her powers, the group arrive to take him down. Botan is drained, and Yakumo claims the power he needs to start his own world. Despite the futile attempts of Yusuke and Kuwabara, Yakumo actually starts the process of making his own world in a scene reminiscent of the Third Impact, or similar apocalyptic scenery. Hinegeshi manages to create an opening so that Hiei and Kurama can wrestle the power from Yakumo's grip. They end up being attacked as a result of this, but not without Yusuke making the most of this opportunity, grabbing the orb, sharing its power, and defeating Yakumo. And it's a cool addition that Yusuke is the only one able to wield the netherworld energy and defeat Yakumo, because in the main story, we learn a lot about how Yusuke's power was coming from the demon world due to his father, so it makes sense that he'd be able to handle its counter energy in the same way that he learnt spirit energy. It is at this point that I have to say though, as someone who experienced the original with the phenomenal English dub, it's a massive shame that they got rid of the entire original cast. The moment we get a great budget, a bigger story, and more dynamic animation, we have to put up with a completely different sound to the characters that everyone knew and loved. And it is bad. The timing is off more often than not, a lot of the lines are delivered poorly, and there's just a lot of difference between the effort put into one more than the other. And that is jarring because, as I said, this film looks better than anything else, with the name Yu Yu Hakusho on it. Also, there isn't any balancing of audio levels, so the last half an hour is just screaming. Just listen to this. They defeat Yakumo and everything is returned to normal. If you think I sounded a bit like a hypocrite in this video, you're not wrong. I kind of praised the Poltergeist report for the exact same reasons that I critiqued the last mission. It even ends in the exact same way atop a building with the main cast staring out to dawn. It even has that same credit song that I once again can't believe was only used once for this movie and not for the end of the series. Instead of sticking to what their series already set up and just expanding upon it, both these movies make a whole new unnecessary element to their worlds. 
With the last mission, they threw Nen out of the window to use Arn, and here they decided that they weren't going to make a story about the demon world, but about a whole new world. The difference here, though, is that Nen is this massive, complex power system that provides a large part of the entertainment to the whole series of Hunter x Hunter because of its complexity, and it can be taken in many twists and turns. So turning their back on that for a straightforward system was disappointing. Here, though, the Netherworld actually gets things right as a counterpoint to the demon world in the same way that the spirit world is counter to the human one. I personally think that it adds to the series and adds to the lore, as I never understood the circle of life within the two worlds, both human and spirit, and why that connection never really seemed to be about people passing on so much as being a spiritual entity separate to that of life on Earth. With the three different worlds, it starts to make a lot more sense, especially with Kurama's long-lost dead friend. If Togashi hadn't been at the whims of Shonen Jump, and if he had continued Yu Yu Hakusho, I wouldn't be surprised if something like the Netherworld actually popped up. But yeah, a filler movie well worth passing the hiatus to. If you like good retro animation and miss Yu Yu Hakusho, I'd highly recommend. I'd give it a solid 8 out of 10. And that's both movies. Overall, that's a 6 out of 10 and an 8 out of 10. Much better than the Hunter x Hunter films, and we actually found something that I'd recommend. If we're still in the hiatus this time next year, then I may end up finding another topic of his to review. But until then, post your thoughts in the comments down below, like the video if you liked, dislike because it doesn't even matter, <laughs> thanks to my patrons, and have a wonderful night.